But what if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? Good morning, Hidden Creek. We're the Mullinax family coming to you from just west of Indianapolis. Marshall, Russell, and Babs. We're going to read Psalm 108 verses 1 through 5 for you. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. That was Psalm 108, verses 1 through 5. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not
I really value a good night's sleep. As, as I've gotten older though, sleep has, has been tougher. For a lot of years, I've, I've had insomnia and I can't fall asleep because I'm thinking about stuff and at various times in the night I wake up and I'm, I'm thinking about problems or issues or I, I'm trying to problem solve. And sleep has been tough, but, but boy, I sure do value it. And one of, the, one of the reasons that I love sleep so much and, and I usually just do it at night. I, I don't take naps very often during the day. But, but the, the reason that I love sleep so much is that when I sleep, I dream. Oh, I, I love the dreams that, that I have. I, I, I love to, to watch things unfold in my mind. And when I wake up, I try to remember what I've dreamed. And uh, you're probably like me, that those dreams are, are kind of fleeting. They're like a vapor that you try to grasp as, as you wake up. But there are several dreams that I can remember in, in the times that I've, I've been asleep that have really impacted me. Uh, dreams that I think are from the Lord. In the Old Testament, in, in Scripture, God speaks to people at times through dreams. Jacob experienced this. You may remember that, that Jacob was, was running from Esau, his brother. He had just tricked him out of, out of his birthright and, and, uh, and received a blessing that, that came from his father Isaac uh, through deceit. And, and Jacob was on the run. Uh, he, had, he had lived this, this life of trickery, fooling his brother and, and siding with his mother and, and fooling his father. And it seems like all of those things began to cave in around Jacob, and, and he was fleeing for his life. He left the, the town of Beersheba, Scripture tells us, and, and went to the north to the homeland, the, the place where Abraham and Sarah had been before they dropped down south into the promised land. He deserved a good night's sleep. Uh, this Jacob, this deceiver, his name means this tricker, uh, he deserved a good night's sleep, uh, a sleep where, where maybe his mind would uh, come to rest as he fled for his life. In Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 15, we have this account. And uh, again, Genesis 28, verses 10 to 15. Jacob left Beersheba, or Beersheba, and set out for Haran, this, this place in the north. When he reached a, a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. This, this stone was, was a pillow for him. And as he slept, verse 12 says, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. That night, as this restless Jacob slept, he had a powerful, powerful dream. Now, dreams are, are kind of a mystery for us, aren't they? Um, most of, most of our, our dreams, uh, they come and they go and they're vivid and then they fade. But this dream was an important dream for Jacob. It was one that he would remember for the rest of his life and it was recorded for us, and so we remember and, and we talk about it to this day. This was a key point in Jacob's development of faith. It was a turning point for him. This deceiver, this tricker, when he encountered God this night, his life began to change. In this dream, God promised that Jacob would be the recipient of the covenant God made to his grandfather, Abraham. Look at, look at verse 13. You can picture this stairway going from this place where Jacob rested to heaven high above with angels ascending and descending. And there at the top of the stairway, the Lord stood. Verse 13 says, There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of, uh, of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. All the peoples of earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And look at, look at verse 15, this promise that was made 
to Jacob, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. In these verses, the Lord, God, God, the God who is the I am, Jehovah, made this reinstatement, this reaffirmation of the covenant that God had made with Abraham's family. And here we see this blessing being stated to Jacob himself. God said, I am with you. I will watch over you. I will bring you back. I will not leave you. Here, the God of the ages promised to Jacob his presence and his protection. Jacob, Jacob was tired. He was fatigued by travel. He was homesick. I, I imagine he was dealing with guilt and regret because of his actions against Esau and the lies that he told to his father. He was alone. He was empty. And yet here in this place, in this place where Jacob worn out, uh, went to sleep that night with a stone for a pillow. Jacob was pursued by God. God pursued him at this low moment in life, met him, and changed his world. How has God pursued you when you don't deserve it? How has God pursued you when, when you know you've done something wrong? How has God pursued you when you've hurt the people around you. God is always in pursuit of us, and he wants to be found by us. Scripture says in Jeremiah that when we seek God with all our hearts, he will be found by us. The great news is that as we seek God, he is seeking us. And here in this place, that night, Jacob met the God of his father and his grandfather. In verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And Jacob was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place. Another translation says, how dreadful is this place. Jacob was filled with fear, and he said, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. That night in that place, Jacob met God, this God who pursues us and offers us his peace and his presence. Jacob recognized the, the sanctity of that moment in this place that was holy because God met Jacob there. And Jacob thought, I, I'm not alone. In that moment, Jacob traveling by himself in fear of his brother Esau, Esau who had vowed to kill him, in this place of, of isolation, God met Jacob, and Jacob found that he wasn't alone. In fact, he was surrounded by thousands and thousands of angels who ascended and descended on this ladder. Jacob said, this is an awesome and overwhelming place. This is a place where I have seen and heard the covenant that God made with my family, and he's affirmed with me. Jacob realized that the God of his father Isaac and his grandfather wanted to be his God. He saw that Jehovah was, was this God that was not constrained to a particular place. But in this place on that night, on his journey to the north, Jacob met. He was encountered by God. He experienced Jehovah on that starry, starry night. Jacob found that even though he was a deceitful person, even though he had outwitted his brother Esau and deceived his father Isaac for a blessing, that God wanted to be his God, that God wanted to be his friend. This was a sacred, sacred place and a sacred time for Jacob. Can you identify sacred moments in your life? times that, that God met you or you sensed his Holy Spirit calling you to himself. Maybe it was a, a place of isolation. Maybe it was a, a time of worship in a sanctuary. Maybe it was a conversation that you had with a friend. Maybe, maybe that sacred place is right now in this moment when you realize that the God of the ages, the ancient of days, 
wants to be in relationship with you through Jesus. The Irish tradition says that places where we encounter God in, in, in very significant and tangible ways, those places, those spaces, those conversations are called thin places, places where it seems that we encounter God the way that Jacob encountered God that night, that we can see this connection between us and God. Scripture says that that comes through faith in Christ. And Jesus said to his disciples, oh, you're amazed at all the things that you see. Let me tell you, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, on Jesus himself. He becomes this ladder for us that connects our sinful lives with the holiness of God. And Jesus is our connection uh, to heaven and our ability to see God for who he is, the creator of everything that we experience. And in those moments where we encounter Jesus, the moments that, that our faith is placed in him or our faith is deepened, those moments could be called thin places, places that are sacred spots, sacred moments where we encounter the everlasting God. For me, when I look back on, on my life, and when I remember, I can identify a number of, of thin places or sacred spots. One of those is in a house at 10607 Meadow Lake. When I was three years old and received Christ as, as my Savior, that place, that time, that memory is a thin place for me where I encountered the God that my family proclaimed where I encounter Jesus who died for me. Another thin place for me is high on top of a mountain in the, in the Ozarks of Arkansas, not far from a small town called Ozone. And there, when I was 18 years old, encountered God who called me to serve him for the rest of my life. In that place at, at Pinecrest Camp, God called me into ministry. And when I look back, I see that as a thin place where the veil between earth and heaven was opened and God's call on my life was affirmed. I can think of a, a grassy park underneath the shadow of a skyscraper in Houston where I asked Meg to be my wife. And without hesitation, she said yes. For me, those places are sacred spots where I encountered the grace of God. And there on that, that hilltop, Jacob encountered the God of his father and grandfather, and that God became his. In verse 18, early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head, that pillow, and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel though the city used to be called Luz, Scripture tells us. Jacob memorialized that spot by marking it with oil, by using the pillow and created a pillar, a stone of remembrance. He marked that spot and renamed it. He said, this place is Beth El, which means the house of God. Jacob presented an offering to the Lord from his own possessions. It was an act of worship where he said, Okay, God, you have called me. You have revealed yourself to me. I will be your follower. And this place is a place of remembrance. He used oil over this rock that stained that rock. And I imagine as he passed that way in the future, he saw that place where he had encountered God. And others perhaps would walk by and see this, this stone raised up with oil on it. And they wondered what happened in this spot. Jacob named the place Beth El, the house of God. He said, this place is awesome. This must be the house of God, the gate of heaven itself. In verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God 
And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, God, I will give a tenth. You see, Jacob concluded that if God was willing to be his Lord, then the Lord would be his God. Now here at, at Bethel, Jacob made this decision to follow God. Now this is an, an important thing for us to know because you and I cannot inherit a faith from our parents. We can't inherit faith from an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or, or someone in our past. We cannot inherit faith from a friend. Our faith in God has to be personal. You see, this God comes to us and personally wants to be in relationship with us. We can't inherit the faith of others, but we can embrace faith in Christ for ourselves. Since God will be my God, I will be his follower, Jacob is saying. Jacob committed himself to the care of God. He trusted God for protection and, and to be the one who would provide this God who would go with him wherever he was. Jacob committed himself to, to be a follower of God all the days of his life. And really, all of us are faced with a decision like that. Will we, will we hear about God and, and will we think that the stories are great and, and we'll think that faith is good for someone else? Or will we personally embrace the, the work that Jesus has done for us? God wants us to be part of his family. The Lord is willing to come to us and take us just the way we are and turn us into the people he wants us to be. Faith in Christ is nothing unless we embrace it for ourselves. How, how will you choose to live life, a life of dependence on God? Are you, are you hoping to live on the leftovers of other people's faith? Now, Jacob could have thought that. He could have thought, well, my, my grandfather Abraham had a great relationship with God and my father has a relationship with God and, and, and maybe somehow that will trickle down to me. And here God is saying, I want to be your God personally. God wants to be your God. How might you choose today to step into full dependence upon God? What choices do you need to make in life to bring yourself into alignment with the plan that God has for you. Jacob heard God's call on that day. I heard God's call high on the mountaintop in, in, uh, in the Ozarks of Arkansas. Perhaps today God is calling you to live your life differently, to go to a, another place or, or to step into a, a new way of living so that the people around you can be impacted by his mercy and grace. What needs to happen in your life to memorialize what Jesus has done for you? Now, for you, it, it probably isn't raising up your stone pillow and turning it into a pillar, but there may be tangible things that God is asking you to do where you say, today is, is the day that I commit myself fully to you. I don't know what my future will look like. I don't know the way that, that uh, you'll provide for me, but I trust in you to give me everything I need in life. I trust in you to give me everything you need so that I can serve you effectively. You know that place, Beth El, that sacred place where Jacob encountered God? I've been to that place. I've driven by that place. And on that place today is a gas station. Now, it's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? Uh, to think that in that place, people come and go and don't even recognize what happened in that space. People don't recognize the encounter that Jacob had with God. Well, here's the good news for you. Through faith in Christ, you become Beth. L, the place, the house of God, isn't constrained to a hilltop or a region or the faith of someone else. 
you become, Scripture says, a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you place your faith and trust in God, you become Bethel. And God wants to raise up your life so that others might look at you and see that you've been touched by the oil of God. You've been marked with the Holy Spirit of God, that his anointing is on you and that your life is different because you've encountered the living God. As you live as Beth L in your family, as Beth L in the community, may the world see that Christ has changed your life because you've said yes to him. This ladder that reaches from earth to heaven and through faith in him, your life and your eternity is set in your relationship with God.
Jesus, thank you for the way that you speak to us through your Holy Spirit. And Father God, I thank you that you desire to know us fully as you are fully known. And so I, I pray that as we lean into your goodness this week, as we feel the embrace of your touch, as we know the presence of your Holy Spirit, I pray that the power of Jesus would flow through us to reach the world with the great news of what he's done for us. I pray your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.